Hello, everyone. Welcome to Environment Technology News Server. Uh, this is a weekly online program on environment technology, and it is managed by Technobase. And this program happens on every Tuesday. I welcome you all. Saurika, Namaskar. Welcome to this Environment Technology News Server. As you know, um, this program is managed and run by Technobase. Let me give you a quick introduction to Technobase for the benefit of our audience. Uh, Technobase is based in Thailand, established in 2005, and it is recognized as International Resource Center for Industries and Technologies. There are two types of service. One is a professional education, other one is a business services. So, when it comes to services, uh, see we have four pillars for the services. We try to engage our clients or uh, industries and also building in the sense we offer building the skills, building the businesses and opportunities. Marketing and brand is integrated where we promote the various you know, companies and technologies through our services. When it comes to services, you know, you have we have trade exhibitions, training and conferences, we have webinars, uh, business networks, we also have publications. We do offer retaining consulting and the integrated marketing and the like, new server like every week we have this program and we do have a knowledge test as well. When it comes to the business focus, uh, we have two types of segments. One is a polymer, other one is a non-polymer. Polymer in sense we cover on the rubber, plastics, polyurethane, you know, adhesive coatings. Non-polymer in sense chemical engineering, technology, energy environment, water and membrane, filtration, separation, and also advanced materials. So we also have this, as I mentioned, you have an exhibition. We are organizing an, an exhibition in Thailand, membranes and filtration, uh, trade expo, uh, which will be held during 29 to 31st March 2023 in Bangkok. At the same time, we also have this recovery, recycling and recovery trade expo, same time parallelly uh, during the same period. I welcome you all to participate in this uh, session. And we do have an online training program. So we have developed uh, 32 specialized uh, membrane technology, membrane filtration online training programs. Um, these are available on schedule on demand. and. Uh, request you to look at our website and knowhow-webinars.com for up-to-date information on this. As I mentioned, we have published books as well. We have a couple of books on water treatment in the UFMF and desalination. So please check our technology store at techstore.technologies.org. For more information on these books, if you're interested to purchase, they're available to purchase. That's a briefly about Technobis. What are our services with reference to the environment technology? But you can always check our website technobis.org for more information. Okay, welcome you all for this episode number 13 on the environment technology news server. Uh, today our topic is on the advances in forward osmosis and water reuse. We have an expert, uh, Mr. Grant Tronley. He is a um, Vice President of Engineering Solution Sales at Forward Water Technologies based in USA. He's very experienced with 30 plus years experience in the water industry and specialized also in membranes, particularly in the EF membranes and working with many companies in the past, well experienced. I believe this presentation will be very useful to you and the Forward Osmos is, is a, a, an in, important and useful technology for the water treatment industry. So let's welcome uh, Mr. Grant Tonley to give a presentation on the advancements in forward osmosis and water use. Thank you, Saurabh. Great, well, thank you very much, uh, Prem. Very much uh, appreciate the, the opportunity uh, in which to uh, talk about uh, for osmosis. I think this is a, a great uh, opportunistic time right now with all the different, uh, uh, I'm going to say, drivers within the market, CO2 reduction, water reuse, um, the, the UN um, uh, strategic development uh, advancement. So, you know, with all these uh, new drivers and um, demands being made on industry, um, you know, conventional technologies 
uh, are sometimes challenged in, in these capacities. So a great opportunity in which to talk about the advancements in forward osmosis or FO uh, and how that applies in uh, water reuse and CO2 reduction. So um, again, appreciate the opportunity. And I'll just my advance my slide here. Oh, sorry. So uh, just a quick uh, intro into who forward water technology is. Um, our focus is on, you know, accelerating technologies. Sorry about that. Accelerating technologies, uh, which is applicable to an environmental for water reuse. Um, we're a publicly traded company on, on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Um, our focus over the past 10 years in R&D has been on uh, the development of um, a technology specific for osmosis, but really going and how do you take it from, you know, the bench level to the commercialization. And there's been, you know, even though forward osmosis has been tried in the past, there were some challenges. So that's what we focused on the past 10 years in our R&D. And what we were able to do, we were able to patent a thermolytic uh, FO draw chemistry, and we'll, we'll get into what that means. Um, but that's the energy that pulls the water, extracts the water across. We were able to patent uh, FO, develop new forward osmosis uh, processes and patent those. Um, so able to kind of take it to the next level, the, the, the evolution. And that has been empowered by the advancements in chemistries and material sciences. And we'll touch on that a bit. Um, you know, 30 years ago, we couldn't really do this. Now with the advancements, this is what's um, enabled and allow us to realize these um, advancements in the technologies. Um, the other component is the systems itself we offer in uh, turnkey containerized systems or large plants, depending on the economy of scales, global operations. Uh, and as I said, we focus on water management. Um, so wastewater, process water, um, brine management. So, so what, when we take a look at, you know, the, the challenges in the industry, well, what industries have wastewater treatment challenges? Well, wherever water touches, uh, you know, a product and so on, it becomes a wastewater. And as such, um, it needs to be uh, treated uh, for either reuse or discharge. Um, when we take a look at, you know, I'm going to say, you know, moderate treatment can be uh, conventional physical chemistry, mechanical separation through filtration. But when you get into more difficult um, waters that have high TDS, uh, high phalanx, high, uh, high BODs, high CODs, they become a little more challenging and it stresses conventional technologies. And typically, conventionally, what we, we've seen with these very difficult to treat wastewaters, um, the conventional approach is burn, bury, or boil, um, either incinerate it, um, bury it into the ground through, through a well, or boil it through evaporation, thermal evaporation. Um, these are very costly, um, but those, the, you know, those are the options and the availability of, of these current technologies for, for these difficult treatments. So, when we were taking a look at uh, technology, we felt that there was a gap in, in the portfolio offering. And as such, this is why we really focused on forward osmosis, because we felt this technology, uh, developing this technology, could really address a need that we felt wasn't being addressed within the market space. So just quickly, when I say difficult treatment, I mean, so that we all have the same definition, what I mean by difficult to treat waters is any process or wastewater that's greater than the 20,000 ppm in total dissolved solids, or there's uh, heavy metals involved which precipitate out, uh, or high fouling, high scaling, um, other components that it takes high energy in order to um, uh, in order to, to treat. Uh, limited disposal options, you know, as it burn, bury, boil. Sometimes there there is no place in which to 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 bury these, or there's no incineration. Uh, and the other aspect is, as I said, for you know CO2 reductions, but also on environmental discharge restrictions uh, that are now curtailing um, and discharge any toxins or or any uh, hazard materials uh, into let's say um, um, open open body streams. So a lot of those. Um, this is what I define as, as challenging in, um, or difficult to treat within wastewater or process water. So 
the market drivers, as I said, is uh, discharge regulations, is restricting, you know, um, we know that we live in an ecosystem. So anything that we put toxins or contaminants into a body, it's, it's, it's going to affect the ecosystem. So it could be um, hazardous to aquatic life, uh, the fish, um, or we may drink it. So discharge regulations are getting tighter and tighter. Uh, as we discover there's there's more um, not only natural occurring but now synthetic um, contaminants that are being entered into the waste stream so discharge regulations are becoming more stricter and, and tighter um, which is challenging um, uh, process or or waste treatment systems um, that their systems may have been installed 40 years ago so may not have the capacity uh, or the ability to treat these new regulations uh, zero liquid discharge or minimum liquid discharge, uh, that is becoming more prevalent in the industry. Um, as we get into a more a reuse and circular economy is how, how do we limit um, the generation uh, as well as disposal of, of the waste stream. So some of this is, is taking that liquid waste stream and basically removing all the water and bringing it down to solids. Um, that's a zero liquid discharge and then minimum liquid discharge is concentrating that waste stream as much as possible uh, without taking it to, to, a, to a dry or solid level. Uh, CO2 reduction, uh, this is a big push within, I'm going to say on a global basis, a reduction of our CO2 or carbon footprint. Um, in some uh, countries there are penalties of not meeting these uh, CO2 reductions. So that's a real push within the market space. Um, and also, as we see, um, uh, you know, with the UN um, also pushing that as well on getting our, our carbon di um, CO2 reductions as well. Uh, and then on the recovery or reuse side, is now as we get into there's more and more drought areas or water scarcity, which means that water becomes a real um, a valued resource. So the ability to reuse as much water as possible. Um, has in some of those regions has significant value um, and if you can reuse more water then there's uh, significant cost reductions so the ability to to extract water from from these wastewaters or process streams and reuse them has significant beneficial use with within plants uh, and then lastly is brine management we talk about those water stress or water scarcity areas um, you know, a lot of those areas have desalination, uh, which is great using reverse osmosis. The challenge, though, is that, you know, the, the remaining concentrate coming out the back end of these, these RO systems are high in TDS or high in salts. Um, in some instances, I'll give you an example, um, dumping into in, uh, Saudi Arabia, dumping into the, into the Red Sea. There's been so much brine discharge into the Red Sea that they've physical sea itself, the salt level has increased. Um, that's like saying, here's the Atlantic Ocean. And I was able to put enough salt in there to, to raise the salt level. It's a massive amount of salt that goes in there, but that's just not limited to that area. That's around the world. So there's more of a focus now on how to manage that brine um, and not discharge it back into the environment. So those are the main um, not all of them, but the main market drivers that I see on a global basis um, that, you know, drive an industry, but really calls for, you know, the demand for new technologies in which to address these, these new market, well, I shouldn't say new market drivers, um, but more, um, more of a critical um, uh, aspect of delivering uh, on these. So when we look at them, on the uh, process or wastewater treatment, typically we look at three things. is that reduce, reuse, uh, and recover. And reduce is that I have a waste stream and I want to, because I'm gonna dispose of it, I'm gonna try to reduce the, the volume and concentrate as much as possible. So if I had 100 gallons, or sorry, 100 cubic meters, um, reduce it down to 10 cubic meters. So I've got 90 cent, 90% uh, reduction, and I only have to deal or treat 10% of that, that water or process stream. Uh, the other component is, is the reuse of water. Uh, we extract the water, you know, pure water from that, and now I have beneficial reuse. I can reuse it back into my process, or I can discharge it uh, or to do uh, aquifer recharging or maybe for um, uh, agriculture. 
Uh, and the last component is recover. Sometimes that there are valuable components within a waste stream, could be uh, organic or inorganics, and we want to recover those. So an example of that, microelectronics, there's a lot of valuable metals uh, used in there. We want to recover them. Uh, and another one is, let's say, on lithium. That's a big one now for um, you know, electrical vehicles or EVs in, in the market space. So in some instances, rather than disposing of that um, the waste, we want to concentrate it because we want to recover. So those are the three, when we take a look at the um, advancements in technologies or the needs, is that reduce, reuse, and recover. Um, those are the, the, the greatest needs within the market space. And again, this is what we focused on when we were doing the developments of, of, of the Ford Osmosis technology. So just so that everyone is on um, an even understanding of what is Ford Osmosis? Well, I'm sure that you understand what reverse osmosis is, but what is Ford Osmosis? Well, Ford Osmosis has been around for, I'm gonna say, you know, millions of years because that's how plants and animals and the cells in your body operate how it extracts water from, from the surrounding environments and brings it into the cells. So we know that it, it's a well-vetted uh, uh, technology, or so I'm going to say um, um, process in which to move water. But how do you take that from, again, from a bench scale to a commercialization scale? Um, so the first thing is just understanding for an osmosis is that uh, the example here is that you can kind of see a YouTube um, with a semi-permeable membrane. Semi-permeable meaning water can move you know, from one side to the other, but only water and nothing else. Well, if we were to take that, that U-tube and fill that with water, and we were to put salt, uh, or we call a solute, on the other side, where pure water on one side, salt water on the other side, what happens is osmosis is that water will move from a high concentration to a low concentration. And think of the, the salt or the solute as magnets, is that the more of that the solute or magnets I have in there, the more water it will be pulled across the semi-permeable membrane. So you see on the right side, the, the uh, results, when I drop salt in, you can see that the water level um, goes down as it migrates across over to the salt water. So again, the movement is, is that water removed from a high concentration of water to a low concentration of water, and that's osmosis. Understand that process is spontaneous and doesn't require, it uses the chemical energy or osmotic energy in order to drive it across. There is no external uh, energy or force required to make the movement of water across that membrane occur. So that's a real advantage for us. Now, the type of salt draws, in order, and I said you drop salt in, is that the different types of salts or solutes that you use, it's sodium chloride, sodium bicarbonate, essentially anything that will add a solute to the water, including sugar, uh, can be used as a draw solution. Of course, what you want to do is that I want to use a draw solution or um, that will draw as um, have as much energy and draw as much water across that membrane as possible. So just a quick comparison. So understanding what forward osmosis is or FO, then how does that compare to RO? Well, you're probably aware that RO, oh, sorry, that RO is a pressure driven device, meaning that I have to apply pressure on one side of the membrane in order to drive or push, push the water across that semi-permeable membrane. Um, when we take a look at you know, applications, you know, if I say like desalination seawater, you can kind of see on the right side here that as the TDS or total dissolved solid concentration goes up, the pressure has to go up in order to overcome the resistance of that. So when I take a look at, you know, as an example of seawater, which is 35 to 40,000 ppm, you can see that I'm going to have to drive a pressure um, to drive the water across the membrane, you know, up to 800 psi, maybe a bit higher. As the TDS goes up, well, the pressure has to go up. And what you find is that with RO, RO is limited by pressure. There's a, a maximum pressure that you can apply across that membrane. So there's a restriction or limitation to RO. And when we talk about, remember the definition of challenging uh, waste streams, where I'm saying, hey, I wanna go up to you know, um, 25,000 ppm or higher, you can see that the pressures would have to go up 
Now, if I wanted to go above that, let's say 60,000 ppm or, or higher, um, again, becomes limitations on, on that pump. So typically, um, on average, you see high pressures around 1,100 uh, psi. In contrast, when we take a look at EPO, EPO uses osmotic energy, as I said, the, the salt, which draws the water, doesn't, doesn't pressurize, but draws the water across the membrane. Well, if I was to take a look at, do a comparison between the amount of energy um, that we can develop using a salt draw versus the RO, well, you can see that using the, the a salt draw, I can develop equivalent to 3,200 PSI. Again, we're not pressurizing, but that's the equivalent energy or pressure that would be um, uh, developed in an FO to pull that water across. So you can see that there's significant difference in the energy to pull that water across versus an RO, which is a pressurized system. So it gives a significant advantage as we get into these challenging waste streams that we need more energy to pull that water across the membrane. So FO plays perfectly into, into these uh, applications. The other component, when you, when you take a look at uh, FO versus RO, we said that RO is a pressure-driven device. So we know that, it, sorry, the, the RO is a membrane um, so it's a physical separation or mechanical separation using that semi-permeable membrane. And when we put pressure on the one side, we drive everything towards you know, water as well as the contaminants within the bulk water towards that active layer. And as I'm permeating, pulling water through, I create a, um, a polarization layer, um, which means that I'm going to start building solids here. And I have pressure on this side. So what happens is that as I develop these solids, the pressure is actually compacting those solids up against the membrane. Um, and as I'm compacting it, I can also drive those solids uh, into the surface of the membranes. Um, when that occurs, when I drive solids in the surface of the membrane, probably heard the term irreversible flux loss. It means that those pores, which the water passes through, are now permanently plugged. Uh, and no amount of uh, cleaning is going to get them clean. So over time, RO continues to lose surface area or flux, uh, meaning the pressure goes up and you eventually have to replace them. And that's the, the, the challenge with, with RO is the compaction of these solids, which again, um, in order to, to get rid of that, you do frequent cleaning with an RO. So, or very uh, elaborate pretreatment to prevent those solids from getting to, to the surface. When we take a look at FO, the difference is, is that, again, it's not pressure driven, which means that a forward osmosis membrane will still foul, but the foulant is going to be loosely adhered to the active layer, and it's going to be in a very loose matrix. It's going to be more dispersed and not compact, which facilitates easier cleaning uh, and easier operation of, of the system, maintenance of it. The other component to it is that because it's very loosely adhered to the membrane, we don't have to use elaborate cleaning systems. We can actually use just a, a, a high velocity flush across the membrane, high enough velocity that it creates a, um, a high enough scouring energy to, to scour and remove those solids. And typically what we find is that we have reversible flux, meaning we don't have loss in flux, we get 100% recovery or 99% recovery of that surface area. So whereas an RO would, can potentially drive and does drive the solids into, this, into the surface, FO, remember, gently is drawing the water across so you don't have that compaction. So it facilitates a lower OPEX cost um, in association to, to cleaning and cleaning frequencies. So as I said before, so one of the things with, with FO, I mean, 30 years ago, we couldn't, we couldn't really do this. But with the advancements in chemistry um, and material sciences, it's enabled us to, to commercialize FO um, to an industrial scale. So part of those advancements in the FO is we take a look at the membrane itself. There's a lot of aspects to memory when, when um, you know, not only FO, but UF or RO components associated to it. And one is you have an active layer and you have your support layer. And the challenge with FO 
is we use a draw solution. In the draw solution, as I said, that salt, that's the energy which pulls the water across. And the higher the salt concentration, the more that we can pull water or the, the higher the flux um, or permeation uh, across the membrane. So the challenge here is that how, if I'm permeating and pulling water through, and I have a salt solution here, well, as I pull water through, it's gonna dilute that. So the challenge was, well, how do I minimize the resistance uh, of this support layer up against the, the, in the FO membrane, which will allow me to maintain a very high or um, uh, a constant salt concentration uh, across this. And without getting into, I'm gonna say the elaborate um, 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 calculations of that, quite simply is that if we make the, the support layer thinner, it significantly reduces the resistance of getting the draw solution up against the active layer. So as simple as that sounds, what we, what we in the past, we had a very thick, this is a microns, about 10,000 microns in the past, which means you can kind of see here that the very thick uh, backing layer, we had a low flux rate. And you can see that as we thin out the membrane, my flux rate goes up. And this is what we, we see now. This is where we operate at around, you know, 28 to L, LMH uh, for our flux rate. Um, as now to get this thinner, people may do that, but right now this is a very good um, uh, operational or structural operation uh, for us. The thinner you go, you can lose the structural integrity. Maybe people will do that, but right now this is a very good operation. Uh, operating parameter for us. So that was the key, is, is to make the membrane thinner. Um, and in contrast, just you know, so an RO membrane um, is 95% thicker than an FO membrane. So that was key in, again, thinning that out. And so as you can guess, is that an RO membrane cannot be used in an FO application because of the thickness of it. So the other advancements uh, were made in about uh, 12 years ago, there was an advancement in, um, in chemistry, uh, the discovery of aquaporin proteins or, or water channels within plants. Uh, in studying that, we were able to take that technology and then modify it and incorporate it into an actual FO um, active layer. What that means is that, you know, conventional, I'm gonna say RO, there's a pore size with um, FO membranes, we can now incorporate these aquaporins uh, in it. What does that mean? Well, the aquaporin you can kind of see on the right-hand side here is, is a water channel that is specific to water. And it's a very small water channel. Think of a very small pore size. And the small pore size will allow water through, but it won't allow any contaminants through. So think of a, a, a basketball in a pinhole that any contaminants or a basketball will not fit through a pinhole. Uh, and by that, you have you know, the contaminants through size rejection. Uh, we get very high permeate quality because this, again, this water channel only allows water to come through and not contaminants. So that was another significant um, advancements made within the uh, FO technology. Allows us to, to produce higher um, um, permeate quality a uh, higher selectivity for water, so it actually helps us with a higher flux rate. Um, and it allows to, to reject uh, more contaminants. Now, the other advantage uh, with uh, this advancements in the FO membrane technology is we talked about a draw solution. Remember that U2 where we had salt on one side, pure water on the other side. And we said, okay, that salt solution, that's the, that's the engine, that's the, um, the energy which draws the water across. And we, we focused on developing, okay, what is the, the best chemistry that we can use that's going to develop the highest energy, the osmotic energy to, to draw that water across, um, but allow us another advantage is, um, a component to it is that with that salt draw, remember, we want to lock it on one side of the membrane. And in the past, um, what was, what's was what been used was ammonia. Uh, ammonia is, is a great draw solution, but the challenge is, is that the molecule is so small, not only will you permeate 
water on one side, but you also have reverse um, uh, salt flux, meaning that that um, the water, the channel of the pore size is large enough to allow the ammonia to to escape to the other side into the waste stream. So in the past, ammonia was was a good uh, draw solution, uh, but on the negative side is that you lost that ammonia in, into the waste stream, so it became a consumable. And the other component, if it reacted with the waste stream, it could change the waste characterization. So again, 10 years of R&D focusing on this is that we said that we, we can't have that. We need to have a draw solution, a salt solution that's going to be able to draw, develop a very high osmotic energy to draw that water across, but we can't afford to lose anything into, into the waste stream. So in focusing on the molecule, you can kind of see that uh, this molecule, which we call triethylamine, is, is a large molecule. And the molecule is large enough, you can kind of see here, that it won't fit through that water channel. So if it won't fit through the water channel, it means that it's, it's locked on this side of the membrane. And if it's locked on this side, it means that we now have a closed loop system with our draw solution. And that is one of the deliverables that we worked on for 10 years, is that how do we lock that in? How do we ensure that it's a closed loop system and that draw solution doesn't become a consumable? And we're able to achieve that with advancements in the chemistry and the advancements in, in the membrane. The um, couldn't do this 30 years ago, but we can do it today. So when we take a look at um, the advancements, now we take a look in the, in the operations, I mean, bringing this all together now uh, of the, the, the membranes and the draw solution. What we find when we do the operations, as I said, you know, when we compare RO, which is a pressure-driven system, versus an FO, which is osmotic-driven uh, system, that because you don't have that compression of the solids, we can see over time that whether, you know, regardless whether we have, you know, whether it's organic or inorganic, um, you know, so, you know, calcium carbonate um, or silica, any type of fouling is loosely held to the surface of the membrane. So what we find is that when we when we run the, the operations for 24 hours, and this was a, a, a laboratory third, third party, this was um, done at um, a university uh, for us, is that as we as we foul the T and uh, I'm sorry the transmembrane uh, pressure drops to the point within 24 hours we know that triggers a clean and when we clean it again flushing with with permeate at a high velocity we actually recover 100% of the flux uh, and we we did that over um, um, a period of time so the flux recovery just using water we're able to get 100% without using any elaborate um, uh, chemistry such as chlorine or, or um, dispersants or antifouls and so on. So again, really aids um, in the cleanliness of the membrane. And the other component is that if I don't have to use chemistries for cleaning, I don't generate another waste stream and I reduce my OPEX costs. So this was um, a, a great benefit in the development of the FO membranes. We found that um, Typically, we don't have to have cleaning, but if we, if we do need cleaning, it's, it's very, very minimal. So reducing the OPEX, reducing the chemical costs, and uh, reducing the amount of volume waste stream that we would generate through those cleanings as well. So when we take a look at the FO and, uh, against conventional technologies, you know, where does that lie? Well, we take a look at um, sort of reverse osmosis. And if we put it on a scale of treatment cost versus total dissolved solids, we find that RO is, is a great technology um, for total dissolved solids less than 35,000 ppm. Um, to me, it's the gold standard uh, of, um, of, of operations uh, because it is such a, a developed uh, technology um, and high um, energy efficiency, it's, it's great to be used at 35,000 and less. But when you start going above 35,000, what you find is that the energy consumption starts going up exponentially. And because I've got to do higher pressure than the material construction, I can't use plastics. I've got to go to stainless steel. I have to use other more costly materials. So the CapEx and the OpEx cost goes up. If we're just looking at conventional, the next after RO 
in conventional, you jump to an evaporator, a thermal evaporator, or what I term as a bulk boiler. It's that the water comes in, we hit it with an, an immense amount of uh, heat, and we literally boil the water off under, under pressure. And that so uh, we recover that vapor and the concentrate. So again, when we're looking at you know, the drivers within the market and the conventional technologies, we felt this was one of the, the principles to it, is that we felt there was a real gap in, in the portfolio offering of technologies. And we felt that there was a technology that, that could really address what the needs are, which fell between RO and, and the thermal evaporator. And that is where FO comes in. That FO really starts where, where RO stops and uh, where, um, where FO can be used as a uh, replacement for a thermal evaporator. And we'll get into it is that with FO, you can extract uh, the same amount of water but at significantly reduced uh, energy uh, costs, like 45 to 50 percent, and a smaller footprint, typically you know a quarter of the footprint that a thermal evaporator. Um, so we have reduction in CO2 because we're not burning as much energy. We have higher water recovery, you know, a smaller footprint, um, and at lower opex because of the energy. So FO really plays, um, I'm going to say, a critical role in the portfolio of technology offering in addressing today's challenges of water reduction and reuse of, of CO2, uh, of tighter um, uh, discharge restrictions. Um, so the FO um, has the opportunities to, to allow clients to, to realize um, those uh, solutions. So when we take a look at conventional technologies, um, you know, from a pre-treatment, so I, I've said MLD is a minimum liquid discharge and ZLD is a zero liquid discharge. On the pre-treatment side, RO is very sensitive to, to phalanx, I mean, scaling um, uh, minerals and so on. So you really need to remove as much as that from the process stream as possible. So when you take a look at an RO, very common that you'll see some type of uh, you know, roughing filter. This is a rotary drum, but it could be you know, a depth filter. Then you go through ultrafiltration, could be microfiltration, uh, and then softening to remove any uh, hardness. So calcium, magnesium, or it could be, rather than a softener, it could be chemical addition to sequester uh, that. And then it's fed into the RO. And then lastly, if you're doing uh, an MLD, then the RO concentrate would be fed to an evaporator. So you can see for an MLD, I've got one, two, three, four, five unit processes to achieve that. And you can see on the bottom, when you take a look at forward osmosis, is that, again, it's not a pressurized system. Remember, we have uh, the ability to take in high fouling, high scaling waste streams. And as such, what we require is a 50 micron filter and an FO system. Um, and if I consider that, I have, you know, rather than the, um, sorry, five unit processes, uh, I've got really one. So you can see that the physical footprint goes down, the capex go, your capital expenditure goes down, and your operational uh, costs go down. So what does the forward osmosis system look like? Well, there's kind of three basic processes or systems: uh, the membrane, uh, the water salt separation and uh, reconcentrating the, the salt draw. So when we take a look at, we break out each one of those uh, unit processes. Well, the first one, pretty straightforward, is, is the membrane, uh, the forward osmosis membrane. So we have a, a, waste, a waste stream on one side and the salt draw on the other. And that salt draw, it extracts and draws water across the membrane. Uh, and re so it extracts the water from the waste, uh, the waste or process stream uh, into the, the draw solution. And that's a, um, a spontaneous and instantaneous reaction. As soon as the, the salt draws there, water starts pulling, pulling across. Step two is, well, I want to do as we permeate and we draw water across into the salt solution, it produces a water salt um, or a salt, salt solution, a brine solution. Well, I don't want that, I want water. 
So the next step is that, okay, how do I separate the water from the salt? And here's where the uniqueness of the chemistry comes in that we've been able to develop and patent, that by using a unique uh, water salt and applying a low-grade heat to the water salt, I can cause that salt to phase change from a liquid to a gas. And when it phase changes to, to a gas, it leaves solution and it leaves pure water behind. And that is how we're able to do a water salt solution. And again, we're targeting it's the salt that's going through a phase change. We're not boiling the water. It's we're causing that salt to phase change and leave solution and leave pure water behind. And that's important. That's where significant energy difference comes in between a, a thermal evaporator and for osmosis. Uh, and lastly, okay, now that I have um, the the salt goes from a liquid to a gas, I'm gonna capture those gases, I'm gonna use passive cooling, and I'm gonna reconcentrate, I'm gonna bring those gases back into a, a, a salt solution. So I'm gonna change it back from a gas to, to a salt. And that's using very, quite simply um, uh, passive cooling. And those are the three steps or, or systems within a uh, industrial forward osmosis system. Water extraction, water salt separation and then again reconcentration of the salt so very sim um, simple approach and simple process to to achieve uh high water recovery at, at low energy just to to touch on this a little bit in case someone um, is interested in the actual chemistry so we use trimethyl ammonium uh, and we react that with co2 to produce that salt so as we draw water across, we dilute that salt. We hit it with a low grade heat, which is 65, 60, 85 degrees C. And it causes again that TMA to turn into a gas, the CO2, which would be a bicarbonate, turns into CO2 gas and leaves water behind. And again, we then take those gases using passive cooling and we reconstitute it back into a trimethyl ammonia bicarbonate. And that's the process. It's closed loop, so it keeps re, you know reprocessing and recirculating. Um, once it once the system's been charged, it's been charged for design its design life. So the other advantages that we have over other conventional systems of thermal evaporators is remember that salt we require a low grade heat from 60 to 85 degrees C. So that low grade heat um, typically is readily available in a lot of industrial municipal applications uh, and it could be in the form of um, it could be in the form of solar thermal depending on uh, the geographic location you're, you're in it could be geothermal uh, it could be a boiler blowdown or, or a low pressure steam it could be maybe a waste heat a heat exchange we can tap in or in some cases maybe it's a landfill so I have methane available to me I can burn so I don't require a lot of energy in order to um, achieve that, um, to push that salt into a phase change to do that water salt separation. And because I don't need a lot of energy, again, we have the availability of, I'm gonna call it a low grade or waste energy, which can drive this process. And if I have a waste energy available to it, I've essentially eliminated my operational costs for the regeneration component of the FO system. So again, I can bring my, my energy and my, um, my operational savings uh, down. On the other side, on the cooling, same thing, is that if I have um, some cooling available to me, it could be within a cooling tower, uh, it could be, again, geothermal, just kind of reverse it rather than heating, I'm gonna use the earth to cool. Uh, could be another heat exchanger, or or maybe there's chilled water within a plant. If I can tap into that uh, that energy, then that will drive my uh, reconcentration. So if I have waste heat energy available to me and cooling energy available to me, essentially the only energy I require for my you know for the extraction of water um, and concentration and reuse um, is the energy required on the recirculation pumps. So you can see that in certain applications or, or um, opportunities within applications, 
I can significantly reduce uh, my OPEX and associated CAPEX costs down to the point that I'm only paying for the, the energy required for recirculation pumps. And that is a very, very unique aspect to um, the forward osmosis uh, system versus conventional, I'm going to say bulk boiler thermal evaporators. Thermal evaporators require an immense amount of uh, energy, either electrical or gas. You can't use uh, waste heat within, within plants to drive those processes, where FO you can. So understanding, we, we took a look at an overview. We took a look at the different system components within FO. Now another uh, aspect of it is that a lot of the times when you're um, retrofitting a plant, well, we've got to integrate in, into the existing systems. In FO, another uh, opportunity with FO is its flexibility in design, um, which allows us to reduce our OPEX and I'm sorry, operational uh, expenses as well as CAPEX. So in that vein, one aspect is that sometimes we have, I call it, uh, we can develop a passive FO uh, recovery. And what I mean by that is, remember is that the, the system is driven by a salt or a draw solution, which is a salt. And sometimes we have those salts available to us. And sometimes if we are located by an ocean, which is 35,000 ppm TDS, well, I can use salt water or seawater to drive or pre-concentrate a process if the TDS level is lower. So what I mean by that is that you always have to have an osmotic gradient or difference that the draw solution that's gonna pull the water across has to be higher in TDS than your, your raw feed solution. So as long as that is achieved, then I can draw water across. So in this case, I could use seawater or some type of brine solution uh, maybe I have a cooling uh, on, then on my raw feed, it could be uh, maybe it's cooling tower or boiler water or, or some type of process which is lower. I can use that seawater or brine to drive that process. So I don't have to have a regeneration site. All I'm going to do is I'm going to be extracting water from my raw feed. Um, and by doing that, I'm going to concentrate the volume up. So if I started with 100 cubic meters, and used a passive FO recovery system, I could potentially reduce that volume by 20 to 30% just using seawater. That means that, well, rather than having to treat 100%, now that capital system only has to be sized for 70% of that volume. So you can see that there's now um, an opportunity to reduce CAPEX and OPEX by using a sacrificial draw or a passive FO uh, recovery configuration. Next aspect is that combining the, the, the passive FO to industrial system. Um, again, this is for like, I'm gonna say free energy or, or pre-concentration, which we're gonna reduce the capital on, on the industrial FO. Um, so with this particular system, I'm gonna pre-concentrate and put it through an FO. And with the FO system, because the salt that we use is very, very high in concentration, we can concentrate those waste streams up to 260,000 ppm TDS, very, very high. Um, in doing that, our system recoveries, typically we see at about 95%. So that is a lot of clean water for reuse and extremely small volume uh, for, for disposal or, or treatment. Um, standard FO design is just the FO, and then the other uh, configuration that we have is sometimes, as I said, FO loves to work in high TDS environments. That's where you see the optimization, the efficiency above 35,000 ppm. Sometimes, though, you have a low TDS. FO isn't economically viable in very low, let's say, 5,000, 10,000 ppm. It can operate, but there's better technologies that are more economically um, um, better to address those applications. But if we still need to go, we have a low TDS, but I have to concentrate it up. Think of a, a medium liquid discharge plant or even a ZLD, I want to concentrate it up. So we'll put an RO in front. So as you can probably guess or imagine is that, well, the RO is going to take the low TDS. It's going to uh, concentrate that up. To, to a higher level, and we're going to take the concentrate from the RO and feed it into the FO. Again, FO loves high TDS environments. 
So the RO is going to create the proper environment for the FO. The other real um, opportunity we see here is the performance of the RO and the FO. Is that where RO is typically challenged um, as the higher the TDS, the higher the energy, um, the lower the recovery you get from an RO. Whereas FO loves high TDS environments. You see that the opportunity here is, is to balance the system out to optimize their efficiencies. So rather than taking an RO and, and I'm going to say pushing it and having it struggle to get recoveries of 50, 55, and high TDS streams, remember we're going to be using an FO, which loves to operate in high TDS. So what we can do is we can actually reduce the RO recovery. You know, as you said, let's say 50%. We can reduce it down to like 35%. And then the FO will then pick up that load. Now, that balances the system out and allows us to optimize both systems. The system recovery is still going to be 95%, but I'm going to see a reduction in my uh, operational capex on the RO and as well as the, the, the FO. So in low TDS, an ROFO allows you to, to uh, achieve an MLD um, um, requirement. Um, or objective, but also allows the optimization um, of performance as well as reducing your CapEx OpEx on, on both uh, systems on the RO and FO. So what does an, an, an FO system look like? We manufacture two systems. Uh, one is a containerized system, um, up to um, typically 250, you know, 300 cubic meters a day on a containerized system. And what you're seeing here is that you can see there's a if you looked inside the container, uh, there's a fluid handling system. This is the TMA, the salt draw, uh, the membranes, and then you can see the, the columns. And what the columns are, remember when we took a look at the different system components is that in order to get the salt to phase change, I have to heat it up. And that's what the stripping column does. Um, so the stripping column, the, the, the salt, the water salt solution passes down through the top to, to the bottom. Uh, of the column, it's heated up, gas leaves, water comes down. So we strip the salt out. That's what we call a stripping column. The next is we need to reconcentrate. So we have an absorption column. And the absorption column, using passive cooling, allows us, it takes the gas and we absorb the gas back into to a liquid via why we call it an absorption column. And that's what you see on the back end here is these, these two columns. So that's the containerized system. Uh, for larger plants, when you start getting, um, you know, beyond, let's say, 1,000 cubic meters, the economy of scale would dictate is that, well, we'll just build a larger plant. Um, so you can kind of see the, um, uh, the, the systems right here in place. So it's always about the, the, the economics. What's the OPEX and CAPEX? And that's going to kind of dictate, that will dictate the design. Uh, that we modeled and then put forward to a client. So when we take a look at the different applications, as we said, whenever water touches uh, something, it becomes a waste stream. Um, so the applications are, are quite abundant. Um, so some of the more common ones is when we take a look at biogas, so like an anaerobic digester, uh, you can see this is a conventional uh, flow sheet. Uh, the digester, screw press, uh, uh, dissolved air flotation, uh, ammonia strip here to remove any ammonias, uh, ultrafiltration, and then a two-stage uh, RO system to an evaporator. And that flow sheet will concentrate the, um, the waste stream up to 240,000 ppm of TDS. With FO, you can take a look at is that FO, again, very robust um, in its uh, operations with a very large uh, operating range allows us to replace the ultrafiltration, the, the, the two-stage RO, and the evaporator, and combine everything into a single FO unit operations. Difference here is that you'll notice that this process flow sheet or process stream uh, is 240,000. This is 180,000 ppm. And this is an actual application in a municipal plant Whereas the client said, look, if you're going to eliminate those three unit processes, that's, you know, I've got a smaller footprint, I've got a um, uh, lower CapEx and lower OpEx, that's no problem. Um, that 
they could deal with the difference between 240 to 180 because the savings within OPEX and CAPEX were, were significant. Uh, another application is landfill or, or leachate. Um, this is conventional system. Um, this is a, a microbiological, uh, anoxic, and aerobic uh, treatment tank um, with a secondary clarifier. You can see that with the FO, we're able to eliminate these three unit processes all into to a single unit uh, of port osmosis. So again, significant reduction in footprint as well as OPEX and CAPEX. Um, fracking, uh, which is uh, oil and gas, or just think of a, a heavy brine, um, this is uh, in this particular application in, in a brine um, just pointing out that the TDS um, total dissolved solids was 193,000 ppm again well outside the range uh, operating range of an RO but well within the range of, of an FO and in this application we we're able to to eliminate the evaporator and put in the um, uh, the FO and still achieve the, the same results that uh, an evaporator crystallizer would be, but at a smaller uh, OPEX and CAPEX. So another application is brine management. Um, and in brines, uh, wherever you have desalination, um, you have a concentrate of salts, but not necessarily any, anything that produces a saline solution is, is brine management. And this is just to point out is that the ability with FO we can decentralize uh, rather than having to put an FO system in every single one of these brine ponds. What we can do is decentralize the membranes. This is the membrane module assembly and just put it by the brine ponds. And then what we do is we have a centralized uh, regeneration system. So this draws uh, the, 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 the water into, um, into a centralized system and then we can reuse the water and it returns the concentrate back. So um, if you have a, a, a plant and I have a, a waste stream here or a process stream here, but then there's another one on the other side, you don't have to install two FO systems. I can just install the FO modules. Uh, another application, lithium brine, that's a, that's a big one. Um, with, our, with FO, um, because you're talking about a brine solution, you're already into a very, very high TDS level. FO works uh, exceptionally well within lithium brine applications. So when we take a look at the, the, the membrane itself, again, um, there's different membranes uh, you can use within the system. We, we use um, uh, membranes, uh, FO membranes that use the aquaporin because that um, is very applicable and gives us the best performance. So the operating range, um, getting into it, it's, it has a high uh, surface area of, the, of the, each of the modules. Uh, it's about 13.8, so it has a very high packing density. I mean, a lot of surface area in a small area. pH range three, three to nine operation, two, two to ten on cleaning. It's a, uh, it's a hollow fiber configuration that we use, so it's a tube. Uh, it's inside out, so the waste stream is on the inside of the hollow fiber, uh, with the salt solution on the outside. That's just to give you kind of a, a um, uh, an understanding. Um, of the, the FO module, the operating range uh, for uh, our systems, um, as I said, is part of it is dictated by the, um, uh, by the membrane itself. Um, energy, uh, total system energy, depending on where, where we're operating, that if we had absolutely no waste uh, energy, uh, low grade uh, heat or, um, or cooling, that we would be around our total system requirement 27 to 43 um, kilowatts per cubic meter but I would I would indicate that every application I've worked on has always had um, waste heat available which typically constitutes about 60 percent of the energy requirements so when waste heat is available or low grade heat our uh, total system energy requirements drops almost you know in, in half so when we take a look at an application, FO uh, application, because there's a lot of variables in, in, in every application um, that we, we look at, it's important that working with a client that we really understand the applications, the, 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 the waste characterizations, and then what we're trying to achieve. 
So we've invested significantly in the development of computer modeling, which allows us a client can send us in a uh, water analysis or waste characterization, and we can run it through our computer modeling to quickly develop whether it's a go, no go. You know, what would be the recovery? What's the fouling propensity? If there's any uh, scaling uh, or um, uh, solubility issues and so on. So it allows us to quickly tell a client whether this is a good application or not. Um, if it is a good application, the next thing that we require is that physical sample, um, theoretical versus practical. I think we've all experienced that, is that sometimes you, you know, on a practical level, you um, see things or discover things that you didn't see on the theoretical. So very, very important to have a, a physical sample. Uh, we take that in to free of charge. We run it through the our FO membranes, and that gives us you know, a lot of empirical as well as quantitative data with respect to our uh, recovery rates, um, the fouling propensity, cleaning frequencies, and, and other components. If that's, um, if everything looks good, then that's a green light, and we'll go to the client, say, here's, you know, an overview. Uh, and if they're still interested, then we do an in-house pilot plant testing. So we've taken larger samples and we run it through an industrial but scaled version uh, of our Ford Osmosis system. And that allows us to run it through the membranes as well as the complete regeneration. Regeneration is important because that's where we, we capture our permeate. And we want to know what our permeate quality is going to be. And then lastly, if the client still uh, is looking for validation, uh, we have uh, mobile systems. We hook into a client's live feed um, and we run that for a month, uh, two months, and that gives us all the data. So if we were to get to a stage four, uh, of our uh, system design validation, um, I typically know down to a penny of what my OPEX and CAPEX costs are gonna be. Uh, usually not required, you know, typically it's just stage one to stage two to stage three, but if a client still wants that, we have capital systems available that we can uh, do a demonstration on site. Important that the client is, is confident um, that the system and solution being put forward is going to meet their needs and requirements. Um, so that's kind of what this, the system looks like. So we're taking a look at some different plants. Um, this is in Canada. Uh, this is a, um, a, a system you're looking at the back end. This is one of the columns. Um, this is an oil and gas uh, where we're able to, um, uh, there's a lot of variability in the waste stream which challenge conventional systems, whereas FO performed uh, extremely well. We're able to recover in these particular instances about 85% uh, water recovery. Uh, another application um, is in India in uh, a, a, um, an application in, in textiles where you can kind of see that um, I just pull this up is that you can see this is a side stream. This is the FO membrane um, extremely contaminated and what they're doing is they're just rinsing it with uh, permeate water and it comes up 100%. So as we talked about, you're not compressing it. Any phalanx or scales are loosely held to those active layers and via V just by, by doing a rinse, I can clean that up. So that is a, a general overview. Again, what is FO? What does the system look like? What are the, the, the processes or steps within an FO regeneration? What are the applications? Uh, what are the benefits? And uh, just in conclusion, is that again, where is where is FO applicable, or when would I consider it? Well, when I have a challenging waste stream greater than 20,000 ppm TDS, it has a high fouling or high scaling propensity. Um, I'm looking to do uh, a minimum liquid discharge or zero liquid discharge, or I'm looking for process optimization. Maybe I, I have a plant that's already, it's at capacity. I've got an RO and, and, and a thermal evaporator. I'm looking to optimize, maybe increase the efficiencies or add additional capacity. And that is the end of our um, uh, presentation. I hope that was um, um, informative and, and uh, gave you some, um, a better understanding of the advancements of FO and how it might be uh, applicable to your applications. So thank you. Grant, thank you very much. It's an excellent presentation and very informative. Um,
Perilly and Jordan is one first line I want to say, FO is real. It's yes. no longer research, <laughs> you know, it's a real. And we've been, you know, talking about for many, many years, you know, it's a kind of research and the lab scale and pilot scale thing, but it is very much real. Yes. Um, thank you very much. It's really very a good presentation. I, I found that you know, the way you explain the theory part and application part and the operation part is uh, very useful uh, to the, all the people who are in, involved in the membranes. I think it looks like there is a huge potential to take some RO market out a little bit, at least, <laughs> in, in terms of the uh, the difficult wastewaters or difficult waters uh, streams that you need to treat. You know, so, yes. yeah. Um, you know, I still have some more issues. I'd like to, you know, have a conversation with you. Uh, first of all, the uh, forward technologies. Um, uh, you guys produce membranes, and also did, and also the systems. Uh, it's a complete solution. So we don't manufacture membranes. One of the things we we, we took a conscious approach is that, um, you know, do what you know. Uh, or do what you know best. And we decided that memory manufacturing, even though we could do it, best to be left with, with, with people that have been doing this for, for years and the advancements. So it allows us that by not locking our, ourselves into a, a specific um, uh, FO technology, then as it advances and improvements, then we can incorporate that into our design. And that was a conscious decision to make sure that there's a, an opportunity um, to advance the system, but also the um, the the, um, the opportunity in which to to um, use other um, um, materials and, and so on. So not to lock us in, it gave us the flexibility that we can continue to advance and, and, and progress. So um, any membrane that that meets the performance and the requirements of the FO system. Uh, we would test back in our facilities, and if that meets it, then yes, we, we, we could use that. The key here is that, remember, is people have tried FO in the past, and, and the challenge was is that the draw solution, the salt solution, would bleed across the membrane. Yes, it would work, but it becomes a consumable, the optics comes up, and the other aspect, you could change the waste stream uh, in a negative aspect to it. Ammonia could react to something and create something worse than you originally started with. Um, so any memory, so it's important that the memory that we take a look at um, and approve is going to ensure that that salt is locked onto that system. So it is a closed loop system. So that's really the, the, the criteria for an FO membrane. And um, you know the, I think, if somebody wants to some OEMs or some engineering company or consult company wanted to promote this, uh, in, yes. uh, this, this F4 systems, uh, if they want to work with you, what kind of business models you have? Because you are based in, you know, other part of the world and maybe the opportunities are, in, you know, other side of, you know, it can be in the, the huge opportunities everywhere that is in desalination plants or on the JLDs, you know. Uh, difficult wastewaters in Asia, plenty. Okay. Right. So there's huge opportunities are there for the, if somebody wishes to collaborate with you, right. um, can you talk about what kind of business models are there to associate it together with forward technologies? Sure, I, I appreciate that, that question, Pram. I mean, uh, excellent, is that you're, you're right, we're located in Canada. Um, right. And in trying to deal with applications, you know, in, in, in in Asia or the Middle East and so on, is that it's it's not, again, it always comes down to the economics, that it's not worth for us to, to build a system here and then ship it across. Uh, one is just on the, uh, on the uh, brokerage and shipping costs, but the other one is that every country has, um, or area has their own unique laws or requirements and regulations. So it could be um, electrical, it could be um, um, in, in an environmental aspect, it could be, so, if we were to ship it over, they'd probably have to pull it apart and redo it for that particular requirement. So, um, so to your question is that our model is that we we like to deal with people that are are, are local, that understand uh, what the environment is, uh, and have the ability to fabricate uh, for us. 
Um, remember, FO, when you take a look at the applications, FO is just a piece of the puzzle. We are one component of, of a solution. Um, we don't sell pretreatment systems. Uh, we don't sell post systems. Uh, what we are good at is FO systems. So in looking to, to partner with, with, with companies, that have the ability to provide that pre and post and, and the ability to integrate our systems in, in, into theirs. So the, the model we look at is a manufacturer representative, um, an OEM, or potentially a, a, a licensee. Um, on the operation side to it, we, we do like to use a build own operate or a build own operate uh, transfer model. Um, reason being is that the client, or I'm going to say the industry today, are, are really pushing and looking towards, um, I'll, I'll define it as infrastructure as a service. So they're saying, I, I want you to take the responsibility. You guys are the experts in this. Take the responsibility, operate the plant. All I want is a pipe that you're going to guarantee me the quantity and the quality out of that. And all the risk is on, on you. Um, and that's why we we built that model and put it forward because we feel that that addresses uh, the movement and the drive in the market space. As I said, is, is infrastructure as a service, if I can define it as that. Um, now, if people want to buy capital equipment, more than happy to do that. But you build the models that are are more applicable and address what 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 the market needs and drives are. Super. I think there will be a huge you know, potential to explore the market in this part of the world. You know? So uh, and you rightly mentioned the one who is doing the you know whole systems, they can yes. utilize your server, you know. Uh, you, you can you're not able to supply whole system, you're only a piece of FO only, you know, whether it's a pre or post, you have to work with engineering companies or consultants, you know. So correct. Yeah. I mean if you, if you take a look at the majority of the time is that you're integrating into an existing system. So, uh, yeah. and your drive is that, look, I need to, um, maybe there's new regulations or, or maybe it's CO2 reduction, but I have my whole system, I'm not going to replace it, but I need to modify or integrate. And that's why working with, with people that have a good, I'm going to say, um, engineering bench, um, you know, good, capable people that can take our system, work with other components, and then integrate it in, into the client system. Um, I mean, if I was a business owner, I don't want to throw it all this new capital equipment I invested in. Uh, I, I want you to optimize what, what I have and work with. And, and a lot of the time is that when you implement the, the, the FO in association with the other components is that you do free up capacity. Um, we've had a couple of uh, uh, applications where a client was was limited, the bottleneck was on the wastewater treatment side, not on their production side. So by freeing up capacity, they could by define it as they could make more widgets and and and, and be able to pr uh, have a higher profitability um, by putting an FO in. And simply what we did was we put an FO in front of their evaporator, which was the limit. And we we're able to concentrate the stream down to like 50%, which then freed up 50% capacity of the the evaporator. Um, so that's just some instances. So uh, as you're you know you're familiar with the the, the, the industry, there's um, lots of opportunities. Um, the first thing is having the discussion with the client because they know better than you. Um, we know what what we're capable of, but what's important to them. And, and it's interesting if you take, you know, like one textile plant to against another or food and beverage or the, the, the needs of the drives are, are, are I'm going to say on a, there's a common denominator, but there are unique needs and requirements yes. that one of these yeah. have. So, it so, helps also the reducing the footprint or energy consumption. It's yes. all, I think each case to case of even the similar profile of industry, but the requirements will be different. And you know? so, yes. um, I, can you talk about, you know, currently which countries you, you're based in Canada? Yes. I mean, so that audience would be understand, okay, we should, you know, I'm based in India, based in Thailand, you know, what countries are uh, the door? Is it exclusive collaboration or it is like any non-exclusive basis that you're working with uh, all the contractors or engineering companies? What is format like? So where where we don't have a, a partnership or an alliance, then it would be um, uh, Ford Water going out there and working directly, but looking for 
for, for, for partners. Again, critical to, to have local people uh, because they understand the markets. I mean, even though I, I've worked uh, for, I'm gonna say 25 plus years, getting a little old, but, um, and understand the markets, there's always nuances. So that's why it's so important to have people, local people, they, they have the relationships and they understand it. In areas, so um, one aspect to, to, to your, your question, uh, Purim, is in, in India, um, as an example, we have a licensee, uh, Goldfinch Engineering. So working with them, great company to work with, um, very solid engineers, fabrication, um, you know, good at integration, uh, good at problem solving. They have all the tools. So what we did was the partnership that we made with them was, was a licensee is that we will license our technology to you. Here's the plans, here's how you operate, you know, the PINDs and so on, and we'll assist. And you go out, you've got a fabrication shop, excellent, go out and build this equipment and uh, and we'll support you in that aspect. And the, the relationship worked out extremely well, very, very happy. Um, also, in same with India, looking at different applications, there's, there's lots of initiatives right now to, um, clean up some of those industries and, and the waterways um, that is, is important for, you know, um, I look at the next generation, what, what's the legacy we leave behind? So yeah. it's, it's important that we clean everything up and get it ready for the next generation. I'm sure they to do a better job than, 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 than we have in, in, yeah. in the past. Um, so you know, textiles, um, uh, food and beverage, there's even uh, lithium in, in, in India as well. So lots of opportunities uh, developing there. Um, talking to people in Thailand as well. I mean, there's uh, wherever there's manufacturing, uh, that's, you know, that's the people we're talking to. Um, we're working in, in the UK. We have a, another partner, a member con out of the UK. Lots of applications there. Um, uh, taking a look at uh, the Middle East, UAE, and Saudi Arabia. Um, so we are all over the over the map. Um, but I'm constantly looking for 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 good partners or, and alliances. Um, as he said, you know, it's it's uh, know know what you're good at. And uh, yeah. I know that we're good at engineering, uh, design, and R&D and advancing. Um, but I look to our our partners to to. Um, to work with the client and to, and to the integration and, and, and to operate these. And, and I say partnership because that's what clients are looking for. As I said, sure. is infrastructure as a service. Is that not only would they be working with us, is that we'd be working with our partner for, for a long term. So critical to pick the right partners, as I'm sure you're aware. Yeah, yeah. So, so there, is a, there is an opportunity to become your licensee in many parts of the world for many supplications, yeah, so. Licensee, um, uh, manufacturer representative, uh, or, or OEM, I, I'd look at that yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. okay, super. So I'm just, so because I'm, I'm asking the point of if somebody's wanted to collaborate with you, how yeah. to go about it, you know, so. Um, let's go into little technical operational aspects of it. You have given a good information. Sure. Um, I'm trying to compare with RO and FO now. Sure. Uh, in the feed water, I see the, the pretreatment is the key for the success of the RO Correct. plant. Yes. yes. Okay. You are actually, you know, we, if you use FO, I think you eliminate a lot of things in the pretreatment. You use uh, maybe the, the, the ear filtration or EFI thing system is enough. Right. Um, you know, most of the RO plants, they expect a certain feed water quality right? yes. in, the, in the RO plants. Is mm -hmm. there any requirement uh, uh, to operate efficiently for the F4 systems, you know, any feed water requirements? What are they like? Uh, ex excellent question. Uh, when, when you take a look at um, uh, RO, typically um, it's association to, to SDI, silt density index, and less, yeah. less than three, which is basically here's a filter and how quickly it plugs. Um, so an SDI, SDI slash 15, 15 minute uh, test, less than three, um, that's pretty clean water. Via that slide I showed you is that I've got a, a roughing filter, a depth filter, um, you know, it could be an MF, UF, and so on. To, to your point, is that you really got to clean this up because the um, the RO membranes are very sensitive to to to, to fouling. RO, and and that's the other component to it is that is because it's a pressure-driven system. 
Whereas FO, as he said, it's not a pressure driven system. It, it draws the water across using the salt. So therefore those, uh, any, any fouling or, or solid developments on the surface are gonna be easily removed. VAV, that um, greater fouling or scaling propensity is that even though it fouls and scales, we can still remove that to a certain degree. Um, so on the pretreatment side, when we do the modeling, we look at one of the keys is that because you're concentrating up, as you can guess, is that if I'm concentrating up to 260,000 ppm, I'm probably going to be passing through some of the solubilities of those mineral salts. So they're, they're going to be dropping out of solution. So what we take a look at is, uh, one, the characterization of the stream, what's in there. Um, I mean, carbonate, sulfates, you know, what's it going to complex with? Uh, we, we run through a very complex model um, because you have interactions as well. And we take a look at, okay, how, you know, the solids, the, 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 the mass I'm going to be generating, the velocity, uh, the surface area, and all that comes into play. So I can take in um, and push past solubilities to a certain degree. I, I can't push a brick through, but I can pass um, to a certain degree. So it becomes application specific, but I can exceed my solubilities because I can clean the membranes up. Whereas in RO, there's no way in the world you'd be able to do that. So that allows us to, to operate in, in an environment uh, that is more aggressive and challenging than, than, than an RO. Other components is, um, you know, temperature that um, typically because the, the FO membrane, uh, I typically limit to about 35 degrees C. Um, a lot of applications, that's not an issue. Um, they can put a heat exchanger in there. Um, some applications, however, you, you, you can't do that um, because the temperature is what's holding the um, components in solubility. So if I just cool it, it would drop out. So in those cases, we can't do, but a lot of the times we can maybe do on the back end. Um, organics, uh, we can take very high uh, BODs and CODs, um, mineral salts, um, oils and greases. Um, that's always a challenge no matter what membrane system you have. So sure. like 20, 20 ppm for, for uh, fog or free oil and grease. Um, boron, this is why we do the analysis. Very, very small uh, molecule will pass through. Um, same thing as an RO, so we do uh, analyze that. So pretty robust, very large operating range. Um, models critical. But um, I'd say oil and greases, that, that, that would be the, the, the main one, the temperature, uh, pH as well. So those are the three main components I always take a look at. And um, when it comes to the operation of the RO plant, uh, there are so many you know, instruments to monitor it, okay? And also the skill requirements. Right. Um, what are the, you know, do they have like a, on a regular basis, what are the things to be monitored in the operation? Um, so take a look. I mean, our, our system is is pretty. Um, the engineers will kill me, but uh, it's pretty simple and straightforward. I mean, three processes. I'm doing a membrane extraction, very very common. Um, I'm I'm heating the salt up, and then I'm reconcentrating it. So we we kept we we did consciously keep the system very very simple. We could have added on additional things like a um, in previous discussion we had. What about a vacuum? Well. You're right, I reduce the vacuum, then I can reduce the energy, but it added another level of complexity in operations and we want to keep it as simple as possible. Um, so when we take a look at the operations is that, you know, pH and temperature is one that we want to uh, maintain. Permeate quality, we, we want to make sure that um, we're not, um, you know, introducing something, maybe all of a sudden something comes through a stream, so we maintain that, and then uh, different uh, flow rates or flow velocities. So we want to maintain um, flow velocity across the membrane, as you're probably aware, because that also adds some scouring and cleaning efficiency. Yep. Um, and then on the end, whereas we do the, um, the stripping and uh, the absorption, we want to make, we want to make sure that we monitor the temperature at uh, uh, temperatures of the heating and temperatures of the cooling. Um, and, and that's not a lot of parameters to measure, but those are the critical ones that we, we, we want to measure. Uh, okay. so, 
you have to say that it is much simplified version than the RO, okay, in terms of operation. Yeah. It, it, but people would, I mean, so I, I mean, way back in the day, I mean, I introduced RO into, in, into the market when everyone said, ah, this is too novel, too expensive, but um, anyways, it's commoditized now. So understanding the operations of, of, of RO, some people would argue that it's, it's, it's simplistic. Um, I say that it is, um, it's a well understood and conventional technology, but the pretreatment is such a critical component to it that if, if not so much the RO, but if the pretreatment goes, then the RO then is, is, is not going to perform well. So uh, a lot of people don't have software to chemical, so you got to have a chemical system, you got to monitor that. Um, so all these levels of, I won't say complexity, but variables uh, in it, and then the RO itself is that am i getting the the proper uh, flow velocities on my permeate side on my concentrate side am i getting the proper pressures um uh, the reject the temperatures so there's a lot of it performs well but there's a lot of variables with an ro you have to stay on top of and thus and there's great ro monitoring control programs out there um that because of the you know it's been um, the maturity of it but if you take a look at it, how many inputs that thing has to optimize it, it it's, there's a lot. Versus us, we're taking a look at, you know, uh, temperature flows and um, um, not and pressure really, not so much, but temperatures and flows and, and pH, those are the critical parameters. So we do have remote monitoring uh, on, on the system, that, that's um, um, key, but it's not, I don't need to have an artificial intelligence or, um, or an elaborate system to operate this thing to optimize it. And uh, you know, in in RO plants, uh, you have this uh, membrane cleaning is one of the significant costs, and also systems are there. Yes. You know, in process cleaning and things. I know. I understand the FO is uh, less fouling. Okay. But I think you still need a cleaning. Okay. What in the system? What kind of system uh, they use in the cleaning of the membranes? So you're absolutely right, is that um, we look at, you know, an, an enhanced chemistry online, that means, you know, I have to feed chemistry on a daily basis. That's like an RO system. With us, I mean, to, to your point, you're still going to have fouling in the system. So there's going to be some type of contaminant and water isn't going to take it off. So it could be organics or, or minerals. So the, the, the same process or principles that we would use, again, Taking a look at the pH, we can go from two, two to ten, maybe a little bit higher. So we use like a citric um, uh, acid um, or acetic um, or, uh, acetic acid um, or, or citric in order to for mineral scales, and then um, for you know maybe a little bit of caustic and maybe some dispersant for 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 the organic phalanx. Um and maybe you know if the temperature is too low then maybe bring it up just a little bit not not too high those are typically the chemistries we don't use chlorine um, the the membranes have a, have a low tolerance of, of, of chlorine yet there, there's we don't have to use that because there's other chemistries we, we can use the the other component is that with you want to avoid cleaning because every time I'm going to say with an RO, an RO you would clean it has about a million ppm's of, of chlorine, and you they will introduce chlorines or some aggressives into it. Every time, my opinion, every time you clean something, you, you lose some of the, the the life out of it. So by putting a pretreatment system and operating to to, to minimize uh, the cleaning frequencies is, is going to maximize the life, the design life of it the membrane itself. So uh, some people argue that 30 years doing this, that that's what I've seen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, you know, one of the significant issue with the membranes is membrane damage, right? You know, inside. And so is, is FO also, because it's not pressure driven. So I'm expecting a less damage or any damage issues also there in the membranes FOs also? So, so you, you're right. I mean, you're not going to experience the same um, challenges or issues than, than an RO because it's two different operating systems. An FO, um, you don't have the energy to drive solids uh, past the, 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 the lumens or into it. So you're not going to, and that's why you can recover it. 
um, through through cleaning because it's just sitting on the surface and it's not impregnated in, into the active layer. So that's one of the significant advantages um, of, of FO reversible flux versus uh, RO where you're going to get irreversible flux. Um, the other components is that as long as you maintain the temperature and pH, you're, you're, you're going to be okay. It's again, FO, you're I can say you're, you're you're drawing the water across and you're not forcing the solids. So you have your bulk solids. An RO drives everything towards the surface, whereas the FO membrane, again, that the active layer is selective towards our, uh, uh, H2O and it pulls the water across and it pulls it, I mean, gently uh, across. So just because of that, again, you're not going to have the, the, the challenges for cleaning. And really, it comes down to if I maintain my, my temperature and my pH, and, and I should say my velocities, because you still want that velocity, the turbulence, to, to induce the scouring energy. As long as I have those three main parameters um, in control, I mean, you should be good to go, and the membrane will last, last a while, a long time. Super. And um, the... You know, a lot of RO or membrane suppliers, they have a software you can yes. design your own. Yes. You know, everybody, I think everybody has now. Okay. In the beginning, said, oh, very few has, but um, you, know, you know, now every supplier, you know, how many yes. stages, what type of membranes, or you want to mix the different membranes. So there are kinds of things that are, right. is the FO is in that position right now? We, we um, good question. We're not there as of yet. Um, so even though we've, we've designed the modeling for it, but we, we haven't, you know, pushed that, that um, uh, software out into, into the market space as of yet. Um, I'll be comfortable is that, you know, when we get a couple more years under our belt and I have more practical operations in which to validate the modeling, I think the modeling is, is accurate, but as, as, you know, as from an engineering aspect of it is that you, you want to make sure you validate. I mean, as we, we jokingly talked before, yeah. you know, um, hope is not a, a part of an equation in engineering. If it is, <laughs> you're not doing it right. Um, so uh, validation is a critical component. Um, I have lots of data points. Uh, from our laboratories and so on. That's what we've done the modeling, um, third-party engineering universities. So the model is, is, has been well uh, vetted. Um, but I always look at the practical aspects is that from my experience is that, you know, you start a plant up and you scratch your head go like, I mean, why isn't it following the model? Oh, and then you find some variable that you didn't pick up within your sampling. Um, via V, we talked about it sometimes at three, four in the mornings, you know, magically a valve turns on and you don't see that. So more practical experience, uh, more, a couple more data points to validate, but the model is, is, is solid. I mean, everything I've been able to predict, I've been able to achieve, but I'm, maybe I'm too cautious. I'd like to have more data points. Yeah. And, um, you know, you okay now so much information about the RO, what kind of problems, you know, operational problems, installation issues, you name it and during commissioning or during operation or you know during shutdown issues. Right. Um, can you talk about what kind of problems we can anticipate while operating, you know, uh, these FO, FO systems? Sure. Well, well one, uh, just like an RO, is you've got to make sure that the, the upfront filter, and I say it's a 50 micron filter. Why is it a 50 micron filter? And it's got to be in operation, is that um, it's a hollow fiber, so it's a tube. It's about a 0.2 millimeter inside diameter. So therefore, that's that 50 micron, as you can guess, we don't want any large solids going into that because it could, it could, could plug it. So it's critical that that 50 micron filter is working. Um, if, you, if a client wants to go even tighter to a GUF, that's great, but it's not necessary. Um, just as a side note, that if we're doing an RO to an FO feed, I love those because the, the RO is my filter. Um, but on an operation, so the 50 micron filter, that needs to be an operation, um, frequency, backwashing, and so on. 
uh, and stand by. Um, next is, is taking a look at make sure that again those controls, the pH is 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 in control, that um, we're not going outside of that. The velocities are there. Um, the other component is that if we have sometimes you have fluctuations, which is normal within your process stream, that as long as we don't exceed certain solubilities, that we know that okay, we exceed this, we're going to get some some phalanx occurring, could be mineral scale or 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 um, organic. But we know that okay, here's the operating range. If we exceed that, then we need to have contingencies and plans of 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 how we're going to pick that up. Now, part of that monitoring is that you, with the transmembrane pressure, the TMP. So the difference between one side to the other, that if we see there's all of a sudden there's a drop, we should say, or, or, or higher, so I'm not getting the flow, then that would trigger automatically um, or alarm that, okay, something's occurred and it's blocking, uh, the flux has gone down and, and there's blockages there. Um, so the key, what the upset is that we have an excursion or an upset which solids uh, or, or something coming across is going to cause phalanx to, to occur at a more rapid um, rate than, than we anticipated. So that's really the only one that I see and that why I'm always focused and modeling on. Um, again, because you're, you're, you're taking your concentrations up to extreme levels, right? 240, 260,000 ppm. So when you're getting there, you, 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 you've got to start um, on top, the monitoring and control of it to make sure that, okay, we know what the fouling rate is, but if there's also an excursion, it, it, could, it could stop the system. So um, nice thing about membranes though, is uh, you can have parallel systems that if one goes down, um, just like a, a, an MBR plant, right? I've got an extras uh, or um, the way that I design is I'm um, <laughs> Good or bad, I like being conservative on flux. Uh, the reason being is again through my practical experience that I found that if you if there's an upset, no problem, I can shut that down, but I can drive the flux here because I've got additional capacity. Um, that's the way I like to design is always anticipate something's going to go sideways. Um, we don't live in a utopian world. Um, something will happen uh, that we don't that we didn't anticipate. Um, yeah, yeah. That, that is uh, nature. You know, it happens without our controls. <laughs> so, Usually, you know, it what? <laughs> Go on. Yeah. But uh, so th that, that's what I would look at for for the challenges is that making sure um, that you're monitoring that if there are any um, incursions from pH flows or whatever, then it, it, it's picked up. But contingency within the system that we would we have capacity that we could you know shut a bank of, of fo membranes down and then pick that capacity up by by pushing the flux up temporarily um and then when that's clean then kind of bringing it back down so normal you know um, i make this up this is kind of what we've we've, we've done in the municipal marketplace and industrial for submerged membranes uh, uf or, or um, plate or or hollow fiber and, and so on so Common, um, I kind of hope that uh, they, they, that's the practice was before, but that's what we're doing within our systems, build contingency and capacity into it. Um, when you know, we talk about you know, standby plants, or sometimes you need to shut down, you have a, you know, the right. uh, alternate options. Is right. there anything that we need to be careful when you're shutting down the plant, you know, to keep the membranes in a, in a good, you know, we can use it again without any difficulties. What are the procedures uh, shutting down the uh, F4 sure. plant? Um, excellent question. I, I, um, I should have mentioned that, um, Param, is that, so the uh, Ford osmosis, uh, as I said, it's spontaneous and it's instantaneous. So mm -hmm. if I have salt on, on the draw solution on one side, um, it's gonna, you could shut it down, but you have no control over that. It's gonna keep going. Um, so one of the things we'd like to do is, is to purge the salt out, right? Take it off and then purge the, the membrane so it, it's, it's clean. It's going to be moist in there. It's not going to dry out. 
um, but I, I want to take the, the, the salt away and, and uh, flush the, the membrane. So that would be a shutdown. Um, on a, on a, everything else then will um, we'll equilibrate and cool, cool down. On startup is we, on the stripping column and the absorption column, we need to bring those into, into thermal uh, equilibrium. So it takes about 45 an hour, depending on, sorry, the size of the column, size of the plant, that we have to get the temperature up stabilized. And once that's stabilized, then we can start the system up. So rule of thumb, about an hour to, 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 to heat the columns up, depending mm -hmm. on, on the size. Other than that, um, you would just turn the pumps on and start re recirculating the, 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 the draw. Um, so shut down, purge the salt, flush the membranes, start up 40, uh, 45 to an hour to, to get the, the, the columns up to uh, um, a temperature, uh, thermal equilibrium. So, again, yeah, so it's, it's, it's not complicated. Keep, so, keep, keep the system simple, right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's now, you know, probably, uh, probably won't be around, but 20, 30 years from now, I'm, I'm sure that uh, as, as FO becomes commoditized, um, I mean, I've, I've lived through RO, I, uh, uh, UF when it was novel and now it's commodity. Um, and as you see, as it becomes commoditized, it becomes the economy of scale, you know, number of yeah. widgets versus cost. And then they do everything to, to and rightly so, the economics to, to get operational costs down. So um, I, I see those commoditized chemistries, they kind of push the, the efficiencies as high as they can go to get the footprint down. So um, I'm going to say municipal applications without naming uh, the flux rates. Well, I'm going to push the flux really high because it means I'm going to use left membranes and a smaller footprint, get my cost down. To me, that's counterintuitive to, to uh, an operation system as we talked about is that you're going to have those upsets. You're going to have those challenges. Uh, you need to have the capacity into it. Um, where FO is that we we built all that in into it. Um, simple system, um, you know, not a huge uh, a capex opex to it, so we have those abilities. Um, but we've designed it with uh, that in mind: is that you're going to have those, you know, potential upsets yeah. or whatever. But the system has the capacity on the FO, and we have the capacity on, on the back end. So our, our turn downs are, are are very good. So. Who knows what it'll be in 20, 30 years? Uh, it'll, there'll, there'll be. So, a, I anticipate a lot of FO um, um, companies out there. <laughs> and you know, the you know, just we were talking about the, you know, one day become like commodity type, similar to the RO and UF and RO. Yes. How is the situation now in terms of the price? Is coming down the the prices the, the FO membranes? It, it is like. Again, economy of scale is that the, the, the more membranes you produce, um, you know, you can then amortize that or distribute those costs over a greater volume. So we're seeing more and more uh, companies getting into, um, like, I guess I said like um, um, Berghoff or Norit or uh, again, still we use Aquaporin. I mean, so more of uh, uh, Torre, um, um, I think Coke is getting into it. So you see all these um, membrane companies realizing okay well fo is there they're now starting to develop their own product line with respect to, to to the fo which is great for us we are not a membrane manufacturer and um as again i look at anyone in fo is is look is my um uh, i have a kinship too because whether we're competitors or not is that you're going to develop the market space and that's what is important to me is get the the awareness and the knowledge of this technology that it is a viable option versus conventional. So um, anyone, uh, there's not a lot of us right now, but there'll, there'll, there'll be more. And, and I see um, on the on the on the membrane side, I mean costs are coming down. I, I already see that, and I actually see the. Um, I'm actually excited. I mean, this is an, enough to see what ceramics do if if um, if these you know, 3D printing with the ceramic materials, if they can, uh, now they've told me, <laughs> I can't say who, they said that they can do it, but I'm still waiting for my, my test um, uh, unit to, 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 to work in the lab. But if they did that, that's kind of yeah, a game changer so, as well. Uh, yeah, that's all one that can be a game changer as well. Yeah. 
and, and I, I do see that evolving. I don't know what the timeline is, but I know that eventually the ceramics, you already see, you know, from 20 years yeah. ago, the advancements that have been made in the ceramics of, you know, um, we're not in a standardized manufacturing process, but take a look at the, the, the pore size is the really in, indicative. The pore size are getting tighter and they're more uniformed. Um, so I'm really excited about that. Hopefully I see the fruits of what they do. Um, so that'll be a game change, particularly um, the low pH, the high pH food and beverage and so on. I, I kind of see that. On the CapEx side uh, for us is, um, I see, I mean, we already have on the books and so on, continue to to to, to reduce, reduce our, our CapEx as well as our OpEx down. And, and part of that is that, you know, as, as the product matures and you get more data points, you start realizing that, okay, I don't need to use Hastel or 316 steel because we said, well, what if, let's just put the best in there. So we're already able uh, or already uh, redesigning, I think we're on version four, version five, is is now fine-tuning not the process, but the physical construction. That we don't need 316 here, we can use 304. We don't need, we can use HDP here. So we're now looking at the material sciences with respect to the, the application and process needs. So so we already bringing that down. Um, and boy, even the, the stripping column, um, looking at um, a, a new design, just you know, different changing of the packing and, and so on. So we're already uh, modeling and optimized that. I th think we're looking at 20, 30 percent efficiency increase in, in the energy transfer uh, right, right there. So continue. So it's a great thing when you bring these, you develop these technologies and bring it. It's not at maturity that there's the 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 efficiency gains that you make up front are are, are large. But when you're 20 years, 30 years into it, well. Now you're okay. Well, we'll change the color. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the, the 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 efficiency steps get get smaller as the maturity of, of the product, um, and, and that's also kind of where I look at as I see um, the maturity of the product. That if you take a look at where, where the efficiency. Don't get me wrong. I love RO and I love UF and MF. They're great materials for polymeric membranes. But when you take a look at the advancements, is that there's not a lot of advancements into there might be maybe the the surface tension the, the water angle so they'll modify the surface so it's a little bit more hydrostatic or a little bit more hydrophilic but there's no significant chemistry change there's no significant design change the efficiency is there it's like ro ro is it, it's there it now becomes whose modules do you want to use um so the membranes i think have advanced um Maybe I'm wrong, but advance as far as you can go with respect to the efficiency, so it's diminishing returns. And this is why we took a look at it, is that from a conventional, if we introduce and develop a new technology, or, or should say commercialize the FO, then we see, okay, it's going to be able to address and, and we're going to get the efficiency gains and, and the OPEX reductions, um, significant reductions versus the minor changes in, in conventional technologies and that's again the push we've been doing this for a while um, we know the water and wastewater and, and we weren't happy with when we took a look at the the portfolio is that okay you're here and then all of a sudden you jump over to a thermal we felt that there was something in the middle um, so as i said 10 years of r d um, a lot of swear words and uh, pains and late late nights but uh, we're able to uh, solve the problems of the past, so we, we can address the challenges of the future. So I think that research for pain, I think it is there for the UFMF also. It, they, it was there for the RO, and because the number of people using it, right. uh, you know, they see the market had changed. You know, we're talking yes. about when I was when I was 25 years ago, when I was a member. Wow, it's so expensive, you know, a difficult to operate. You know, so much uh, wow is kind of now. Yeah. Everybody, every OEM, everybody, every factory, the, it is a, uh, in a water treatment is integral component. And because it is, um, it gives the reuse, it gives high, high purity water, you name it, you know, you can, the wonders. Membrane technology is really great wonders for the water treatment, you know. Yes. 
Right, yeah, so I do find it interesting because I'm again old enough that you know I, I've lived through the 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 evolution and maturity of these, and um, I do find the occasional time I find it working with with engineers, engineer consultant houses, and that they say, oh yeah, well UF is this, and here's the number, and I kind of smirk, going like, you have no idea where that number came from. Um, so I, I mean, some of it is just kind of back of a napkin. Uh, there you go. And all of a sudden it became doctrine in, in, in industry. So um, I'll give you an example was um, people say we said, OK, we did a quick calculation between, OK, the mixed liquor concentration versus energy. And we said, OK, well, ah, we'll peg it. right. It was literally we'll peg it right here. And then you hear engineers. Well, that's, you know, that, that's the operating specification. We're going like we kind of made that up because we it made it up sort of like because it it kind of made sense around there anyways that was one another one is the configuration of having the membranes on on uh, as a separate unit and not within the um uh, aeration tank uh, the evolution of that what i, mean, I could go on for for hours on this but the evolution with that was um it wasn't this technical we're going to do this because the for efficiency is because the operators were complaining that they couldn't get to service the aeration heads so it's like, okay, we'll just move this out of the tank. And now it's like, well, you move the membranes into the tank because it, uh, it, was, it was caused because the operators were complaining we can't get to 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 to, yeah. to diffusion heads and so on. Yeah. It's, it's pretty pretty funny. And then uh, um, cyclic aeration and so on. I mean, there's if you if you know the background stories to it, it's kind of humorous when people are, okay, this is the doctrine, but it's it's the same evolution, right? It's it's you you going up the, the maturity the, the the evolution curve the development curve is that you try this you try that you you know and you you start on on, on a very wide but slowly you, you you come together and and then all of a sudden you have standardization in the industry whereas i'm doing this you're doing that eventually you kind of come up and you meet the standard docs or best practices approach uh, i think we're to, you know you'll see that in 10 years i mean we're kind of leading the pack right now but in 10 years i think you, you'll see a lot more multiple fo and i i think you'll start seeing standardization companies like awwa or or or, or, or wef or whatever you know will start forming these committees um eventually so and it's yeah. the maturity of a product so yeah. i'm, I'm agree it has huge potential. I'm sure that it will become an accommodate like an RO or like EFMF like that. You know? So, you know, you have three segments of the FO, right? stage one, stage two, stage three. Yes. And uh, among these, is stage two and stage the more expensive component of the FO systems? Uh, good, what is it like? Good, good question. So the, the, the membranes itself is, is I'm going to say, the less um, expensive uh, on the capex, um, yeah. so and that's why I like being. Hey, I'm going to be conservative because it doesn't represent a very large component of, of, of the capex. So I'll put more modules in there. So that that's an easy one, uh, straightforward. Um, so I just need you know the the, the manifold and research pump. That's it. Um, the regeneration process that that's where the capital expense comes in. So I'm going to say the 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 stripping and the absorption columns. Um, because they're they're quite large, um, we we need to put some customization into that. The capex on that is large. Um, the chemistry itself, just so you know, I mean, we we the TMA and the CO2, those are commodity readily available, but we own the patent when you when you combine them and use them in an FO. So readily available, it's not like it's proprietary. You know, you have to come to me for it. Um, so that's not a significant cost to the system. Um, the the other components are, you know, uh, the heat exchangers, instrumentation, um, but the biggest one is, is going to be the the absorption uh, towers. Um, other capital costs, as I said, if we don't have a waste or, or low grade heat available to us or waste heat, then we've got to put in our own heating source. So uh, could be um, probably a boiler. Um, and then we'll, or maybe even a, I won't say electricity, it's too high. Gas um, is probably a better way of going, but putting in a boiler, some type of um, a hot water system. Um, and then on the cooling side, if we don't have cooling 
available to us, then we need to put in some type of passive cooling, like a, uh, a low, um, a small uh, chiller system, or Freon system or, or, or whatever. So we need to get those systems and put a turnkey system in them, then that becomes part of the CapEx as, as, as well. So I'm always, that's why it's so critical to have partners and do an audit in the plants yeah. and what's available to them. Do, if you have a boiler, great. Can I have that? Perfect. Chilled water, great. Can I have that? Um, can I have, you know, you know, are, are you going to pump the, the the raw feed to me, or do I need to pump that up? So um, I always look for again, it's the economics, economics, economics. Is that yeah. how am I going to integrate, and how can I utilize ex existing systems? And that's why it was critical when we did um, uh, did the development of the design that we had the flexibility into it, not just you know um, one size fits all. Um, so membranes, not very expensive. Um, the towers, uh, the columns, I should say, that's more of a, a capex, and then the rest of, of the components um, of the, the containers and so on, that makes up the, the rest of the capex. Grant, uh, I can keep on going this discussion, but <laughs> I think we need to we need to end somewhere. Um, I have one final point to ask you. Sure. You know you. You, I wanted to give an advice to the these this company nearing companies. Sure. Uh, some tips to sell this FO as part of their system to their end users. So, what kind of tips you tell? You know, a uh, hey, kind of um, USP you call it. You know, or uh, right. sales sales pitch point. Uh, this is a way to go. You know, and uh, you know you are the master of the game on this so can you give some <laughs> input on it so that uh, these oems or you know when they offer this you know the you know, engineering company they when they offer this you know, their systems to the companies you know right. why they integrate it you know you know how so right so um i i would say when when, when you're when you're qualifying an, an opportunity i mean you're always you, you have to deliver value it's not like like for like so to to your point prim it's like how do you differentiate so I always look at the first thing is, is qualify, understand what an FO, FO is. The FO system likes to operate in high TDS for challenging waste streams where conventional isn't there. So that's the first one. If that, that checks the box, that's what you're going to look at. The other ones, I, I, I'd love to say it's really difficult to sell. It's, it's not that difficult. You're saying that if a client is looking to, um, they have conventional um, uh, treatment systems, by putting an FO in, you're going to immediately have differentiation. So your CO2, so in Europe, um, hopefully North America catches up to, to Europe and Asia. And <laughs> um, but if CO2 or decarbonization is there, um, then clearly, again, you're, you're going to be burning or requiring less energy. So CO2 reduction is associated to that. Um, also, um, as I said, the energy requirement is going to be lower. The, the footprint is going to be smaller. So sometimes there, if you're doing an integration, I've got this postage stamp that I've got to put a system on. So that helps facilitate when, when you're very concentrated in the small footprint. Uh, water reuse is, is another component where we see, I mean, I've seen so many maps, which is, it's just depressing um, to see more drought and water scarcity that um, VAV, the drive, you got to start reusing more water and, and, and uh, starts with conservation. Just, you know, that's why I say conserve the water. Don't try to pull it from, from the waste, but from your waste stream, use as much as possible. I mean, think of it, if it's liquid, there's water in there and we can pull that out. So it yeah. um, doesn't matter how, how, how dirty it is, we can extract that water out, but the economics of using FO makes it very applicable. So if it's CO2 reduction, energy uh, reduction, um, uh, a small footprint um, or water reuse, I mean, right away that qualifies the the, the, the account. Um, I can give you a couple examples. I mean, municipal, they're killing a project because they're, they're doing a conventional. And I said, okay, we can eliminate all those three unit processes and going there. I had to meet with the engineering consulting company three times to explain my math and then finally the, the project's back online because they couldn't believe that you could do that with a single unit and the cost savings associated to that uh, blew them away and that's just one example um, it's like you introduce a new technology um, and all of a sudden 
people uh, are, are allowed to realize that these uh, are allowed to realize opportunities and in, in, in value which they couldn't realize before so the old saying is, is you know tools of the past aren't going to solve the problems of the future and, and that's why it's critical not only our technology but other companies continue to develop yeah. new technologies to to address it, and, and move the needle forward on becoming better environmental stewards better water reuse, better water management, better brine management. I mean, not just us, everyone needs to contribute to this. Super, Grant, I uh, really enjoyed it. I learned a lot. Okay, uh, so much eye-opening and I see the great uh, future, you know, applications for the F4, not just in Canada or in the US. Of course, yes. all advanced technologies have been, you know, it has to start in, a, you know, Western countries first, and uh, you know we we learn all the lessons, and then we you know in other parts of the world like in Asia or in the Middle East, uh, we yes. utilize you know because yes. you already been through all the uh, operational issues, and uh, you kind of fine tuning the systems. Okay, um, and uh, thank you very much uh, for this presentation. Any final message to the audience? Yeah, please. Be be good water stewards. Be good environmental stewards. Make uh, make the world a better place than, than than you than give back more than you took and make make sure that the next generation is uh, is is well positioned and uh, are not going to have to solve the problems that we created. Anyways, that's I'm too young. To, uh, well, having kids in that, I, I look at it's okay. I've got more more runway behind me than ahead of me so i'm looking to what what's the next generation what's what's the legacy we're going to leave behind for them yes well said uh, grant i uh, really enjoyed again uh, i think your final message for the, our next generation for our daughters for our sons and their families we keep uh, conserve the water treat the water well and uh, keep it clean, the rivers or the environment overall. You know, I think the FO plays a significant role uh, you know, in, in this journey for our uh, kids' uh, future. Okay. Yes. And, uh, well, um, thank, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Much, much appreciated and very much enjoyed our, our, our discussion. Thank you again. Yeah, thanks Grant. Okay guys, uh, that's the end of this uh, session today. You know, that's a Grant. John Lee, you know, he is the vice president of the near sales at the Forward Water Technologies. He discussed about the advancements in uh, forward osmosis and water reuse. I think all of you get a clear picture of what is FO, where it fits, how it benefits for all, you know, I'm sure that um, all of you learned some very useful uh, points from this presentation. If you'd like to be in touch with uh, Grant, please do so. As uh, so they have a lot of collaborative activities, whether it can be a licensee or as a, a various partnerships opportunities are there, please reach out to Grant at the uh, Forward Water Technologies. So with that note, I thank you all for joining this session today and hoping that you find it really useful. And if you want to watch this session again, you can always go to our uh, Technobit channel at, uh, at each, and on YouTube. So check it out. Um, or even wanted to see all the past episodes, uh, please do check on uh, on YouTube. Okay, that's all for now. Thank you all uh, for joining this episode today, and I see you in the next episode. Bye bye for now.